everybody, welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we have a paid instructional video for War Bonds, which will be seeking crowdfunding very soon. And you can find all of the specifics about when and where you can crowdfund this project in the description below. So be sure to check that out. Now, War Bonds is for two to five players, ages 14 plus, and it lasts around 60 to 180 minutes according to the publisher. I also want to mention, of course, that as is always the case when I'm doing a video for a crowdfunding project, everything that you see here is subject to change. The rules I'm working off of are the beta edition rules, and they, along with the components, could change in any number of ways between now and the final product. There are three possible ways to achieve victory. If you are the last player with a surviving Warlord and War Camp, then you win. If your Warlord dies or your War Camp is destroyed, then you are defeated and eliminated from the game. If you are the first player to obtain a level 3 War Camp, then you win. And if the Dragon Token reaches the end of game slot and you are the player with the largest army size, you win. To begin setting up the game, first place out the dueling table. Near the dueling table should be the initiative table. And below all that should be the battle map. The player count will determine how many wild terrain spaces are on the battle map. The total wild terrain that should be available will be one plus one per player. By default, there are six wild terrain spaces spread across the map. This is the number that you would need for a five player game, of course. If you have fewer than five players, cover up terrain spaces with these Plains Terrain tokens like this until you have the appropriate number of wild terrain spaces. It's recommended to avoid covering up the forest wild terrain in the center of the battle map. There are extra wild terrain tiles included with the game. You can use these extra tiles to customize the battle map. By placing these tiles on top of a battle map space, the tile replaces the default space with what is displayed face up on the tile. It is recommended to place these wild tiles at least seven orthogonal spaces away from each other. Players also start the game with their selected Warlords reference card as well as the Universal Abilities and Rules reference card. As you can see the other side as the Universal Abilities. Each player should receive a player guide. These booklets contain information for players to quickly reference event rules, icon terminology, alignment rules, terrain effects, war camp stats and abilities, unit stats and abilities, and other useful information. By using these booklets, players will select their warlord at the start of the game. Additionally, they will reference it when determining which squad units they would like to deploy in their army. At the start of the game, each player takes turns selecting their Warlord, as well as their starting war camp position on the battle map. Now throughout this video, just for simplicity's sake, you may see me put a unit out on the board like this without the player color token underneath it. Just know that when you're playing, all of your units will always have your color token underneath it to make it easy to see whose units are whose. The first player to select their Warlord and War Camp position is Player 1. They should be provided with all Player 1 labeled War Camp and Army color tokens, as well as their Warlord's ID pieces. And it must be placed in encampment form like this. War Camps must be placed in encampment form like this. They cannot start on this side. They must be placed two or more spaces away from Wild Terrain, so one, two and seven or more spaces away from another player's war camp, if possible. The player places one of their Warlord ID pieces directly on the camp, and their other one using this initiative number here on the initiative table. After all players have received all their components and placed their Warlord ID tokens on the initiative table, then place the current turn indicator on the top left corner of the initiative table start slot. Place the dragon token in the bottom left corner here, and the game can now officially start its first round. 
This starts with the player whose warlord has the lowest initiative score as indicated on the initiative table. And that's the setup. Now, let's discuss terrain a little bit. Every square space on the battle map represents terrain. You've got plains terrain, wild terrain, enhanced road terrain, and all of this has various movement costs. Terrain affects units and war camp movement, but also has other effects. Up to two units can occupy the same battle map space, one on the ground and another in the sky directly above it. Only one war camp can occupy a space, though a unit can occupy that space alongside it. War camps can never occupy the same space as other war camps. When handling movement, players must consider the movement cost of each space being moved into. By default, most spaces on the battle map are planes. As we've mentioned, the battle map can be modified based on player count or just for customization purposes. Terrain movement costs are listed in the player's guide currently on page six, as you can see here. Terrain movement costs are listed in the player guide's terrain section. If any of the movement type icons are not present on a space, meaning this boot or this horseshoe here, or the wings here, as you can see, those are not listed on the vast majority of spaces. In that case, a movement cost of one must be assumed. So moving here would cost one, but then moving into this wild space here will cost two when moving on foot. But a mounted unit, it would actually cost three. The wild tiles have this side showing those same movement values, but the other side is the road enhancement side. This overrides both movement costs down to one. Above each space on the battle map, there is considered to be sky terrain. Sky terrain movement costs are the same for both movement types. You can also see there are some specific icons for sky terrain movement. You have ground to sky with the arrow pointing up, sky to sky with these arrows pointing side to side, and sky to ground with the arrow pointing down. Sky terrain also has an attacking into bonus shown here. This combat bonus applies when a unit attacks into a sky terrain that is occupied by their targeted unit. The attacking unit will gain plus one APT or attacks per turn. The sky terrain tiles themselves have this same symbol here to help you remember. When a squad unit ends their turn on a wild terrain, you can see there's a end of turn effect. This effect applies once each time a unit ends their turn here. By ending their turn on a wild terrain, squad units gain one loyalty. Keep in mind that end of turn effects do not trigger on disabled units. There are three types of terrains in the game. Roads can enhance ground terrain, but not sky terrain. Ground terrain will always use the battle map, while sky terrain uses these smaller sky tiles with these clips on it, which creates a sky pedestal for use when units are in the sky. Planes are the default terrain. Plains has no terrain occupation effects. Its rivers, structures, and other elements are only decorative. Wild Terrain provides units with the Deploy Wild Unit Universal ability. And as we mentioned, squad units can also gain loyalty from it. We'll discuss all of the abilities in more detail in the third video of this series. Sky Terrain allows two units to occupy the same space of the battlefield at once, with one on the ground and one occupying the sky directly above it. Only units with flying enhanced movement can move into and occupy sky terrain. As you can see, the Valkyries do have that movement type. Anytime a unit is in the sky, their battle map ID piece needs to be on a sky pedestal piece. Sky pedestals are only used when a unit with flying needs to move into and occupy sky terrain. When they land on the ground, then these pieces are removed from the board. The initiative table is a row and column based board that uses two game pieces to navigate through each game round. The current turn indicator steps through each round for all units and war camps placed on the initiative table. The event track at the bottom uses the dragon or current round indicator to track events and triggers the 
Endgame. There is a directed flow for how to move the current turn indicator and dragon pieces, as indicated by the silver arrows and small breaks on the initiative table's slots. If you'd like, you can put the CTI, the current turn indicator, in one of the plastic stands so that it stands up as you move it along the initiative table. The current turn indicator provides players a clear indication of which in-game unit or war camp is currently handling their respective turn. The current turn indicator moves from top to bottom and then left to right. It will also skip over all empty spaces on the initiative table and will keep moving until it reaches a unit or war camp ID piece. It will always start each game round in the top left corner, and it will never move backwards. Eventually, it will make its way all the way to the start new round space here. That's when the current game round ends and the next game round begins. This cycle of movement for the current turn indicator will continue until either a player achieves victory or the dragon moves to the end of game event on the events track. When a unit is deployed, their initiative ID piece must be placed onto the initiative table. You can see that this has the initiative value here of seven, and these columns are considered queues, essentially. So with an initiative value of seven, the token we placed here, slide it on up, and it is now second in that column for initiative seven. And so as the current turn indicator moves down and then comes back to the top, moves over, and we trigger this warlord, moves down, comes back to the top, and keeps moving like that. Eventually, when we get here, this arrow shows you that it moves to this area. You can see there's arrows down here, and these will show you the order in which it moves. Anytime the current turn indicator makes it to the bottom of a column and there's nowhere for it to go, you can see that it's blocked in here. That just means that it goes back to the top and then moves over because there's an opening here. If a unit's ID piece gets moved out of its current initiative column, like this, then that creates a vacancy. All lower slotted unit ID pieces within the column get floated upward like this. In the rare case that an initiative column is completely full, as you see 7 is here, if another unit needs to go into that column, so here's an initiative 7 unit, then it will actually go into the column one column higher and push down anything that would come after it like this. Now let's discuss the war camps section. Each war camp ID piece is placed on their labeled slot, so player 2 goes on player 2, etc. The current turn indicator will move through this column starting at the top, moving downward, allowing each remaining war camp to have its respective turn. When the CTI reaches the bottom of the column, it then moves into repair and then collect. After handling these events, the CTI then proceeds to the recall column. In the war camps section, there is the ID column here which is where the war camp player IDs are placed. There's the DP column, which is where 10 sided dice are placed to track the damage accumulated by each war camp. The level column indicates the current level of each player's war camp. When a war camp gains one or more war tokens, it's placed in the level slot. When a third war token is placed in the level slot, these three war tokens are immediately exchanged for a level token. When the CTI moves into the repair slot, all war camps repair X DP, where X is based on the war camp's recovery rate stat. When the CTI moves into the collect slot, all players collect any loyalty tokens that are beside their respective war camp's level slot, and players can distribute these loyalty tokens to any of their deployed squad units. They also will collect one of their army color tokens stored within the graveyard. The unit recall column is where units are placed whenever a unit is in the state of being recalled. A recalling unit remains disabled and in play until their recall turn gets handled. When the CTI enters the recall section, each unit initiative ID piece within the column will have their recall turn handled in the order they entered. It's a queue just like over here.
The CTI moves from the top of the column down to the bottom, stopping to handle each recalling unit. While each unit's recall turn is handled, their owning player decides whether to proceed with a successful recall or opts to cancel the recall. With a successful recall, the unit's initiative ID and battle map ID pieces are returned to the unit recruitment bin. The owning player gains a loyalty refund. Place these loyalty tokens in the player's war camp level slot. These tokens will be available to the player during the war camp's next collect event. When the CTI reaches the bottom of this column, it proceeds to move to the last section of the initiative table here. This last section handles the final phase of a game round. When the CTI moves into this section, it proceeds downward as you might expect, triggering each slot as it goes. First, it will trigger Move Dragon. When the CTI moves onto the Move Dragon slot, the Dragon piece is moved one space along the Purple Events track. It then triggers the event it moved onto. Keep in mind the Dragon doubles as the current round indicator, and the game ends when the Dragon moves onto the last slot of the events track, the end game event. When the Dragon moves onto War Speech, the players choose between gaining either one loyalty or one leadership for each currently deployed unit they have. When the dragon moves on to persuade, starting with player one, each player decides whether they want to persuade one enemy unit. To persuade an enemy unit, they would pay two leadership as indicated here and target one enemy squad unit within their warlord's presence. That unit loses one loyalty. If doing this initiates a recall as a result, then you can gain ownership of that unit. The unit will not get recalled or disabled. It should also be noted that for each of the unit's alignments that match your Warlord's alignments, the leadership cost is discounted by one. So for instance, if this lawful good Warlord was trying to persuade these Chaos Evil Begotten Witches, the leadership cost would be two. Because nothing matches. If this neutral Warlord was trying to persuade this neutral unit, the Adept Archers, then the cost would be one because there is one match neutral. And if this Chaos Evil Warlord was trying to persuade these Chaos Evil Begotten Witches, then the leadership cost would be zero as both Chaos and Evil alignments match. When the dragon moves to influence the public, each player, starting with player one, bids leadership to influence public opinion. Bidding continues in player order until the highest standing bid wins. Bids cannot tie. Only the winner of the bid pays leadership. If no player makes a bid, then stifle rumors occurs by default. But assuming there's a winner, the winner will receive two war tokens. And they must either enforce order, incite revolt, or stifle rumors. The winner can then optionally have the dragon move one additional space, which will trigger battle cry. If the winner chooses to enforce order, then on the battle map, all law units will receive one loyalty. You can see the pain bringers are law evil. Enforce order causes all chaos units to lose one loyalty. Also, chaos aligned warlords are not allowed to choose enforce order when influencing the public. If incite revolt is chosen, then on the battle map, all chaos units gain one loyalty while all law units will lose one loyalty. Law alignment warlords are not allowed to choose incite revolt when influencing the public. If stifle rumors is chosen or is selected by default, then all warlords gain one leadership. When battle cry triggers, all warlords gain one leadership. And then as you can see, all other events on here are just a repeat of one of the previous ones. Next, the CTI will go to Concede. When it reaches the Concede slot, starting with player one, each player is given the option to concede and quit the current game session. If a player decides to concede, if a player decides to concede, they will place three war tokens on three different spaces within their war camp borders, and then they remove all of their remaining pieces from the game. These war tokens can then be collected by any unit that ends their turn on a space with that token. Next, CTI goes to exchange leadership. Starting with player one, players can pay loyalty, as you see here, from any of their units to gain leadership 
for their warlord. For every three loyalty paid split across the number of units, that player's warlord gains one leadership. Next are end of this round effects. When the CTI moves onto this slot, any this round tokens that were placed on top of a unit's battle map ID piece can be removed as its associated effect has now ended. White tokens, however, will remain in play until the affected unit starts its turn. Next, the CTI moves to flip and enable. When the CTI moves to the slot, players must physically flip each disabled unit such that they are no longer displaying the disabled icon. These units are now enabled. Remember though, any units that are in the recall section remain disabled. Finally, the CTI moves to start new round. The current round has officially ended and the CTI is moved back to the start slot. When the end of game is triggered by the dragon, the game immediately ends. Each player calculates their army size. The player with the largest army is victorious. A player's army size is equal to the total sum of each individual unit's army size. A warlord is always considered to have an army size of one, while a squad unit's army size is based on its remaining squad members, which is this number here minus its damage. So if the Painbringers were undamaged, their army size is 11. If there is a tie for the largest army size and the player with the most leadership is victorious, and if there is still a tie, then that tie is broken in player order. And that is part one of our three-part series for War Bonds. Part two will likely be the longest part of the series and will cover units and combat. And in part three, we'll cover abilities, dueling, and war camps. Be sure to come back and check those out. Also, be sure to check out War Bonds when its crowdfunding campaign launches. And again, you can find all the particulars for that in the description below. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.